Hi, I'm Melissa George with The Mindful Heart. Today's story is called The Philosopher's Stone, Which Was Lost, and it was written by Anne Bowley. The mermaids and the seagulls were collected in crowds upon the shore. There was hardly a sound except the monotonous splash of little waves breaking and the rippling rattle of the shingle as it followed the water returning. Thousands of eyes were fixed upon the piece of rocky land that jutted out into the sea where the philosopher's magnificent castle stood, or had stood, for there was now very little of it left. No wonder the mermaids and the merbabies and the seagulls were astonished. Even the sea speckled with fish who were putting their heads out of the water to watch, for the philosopher's castle was fading away melting like mist before the sun. The philosopher himself could be seen rushing about, tearing out his scanty white hair. And there was another equally astonishing thing. For only yesterday, the philosopher had been young and handsome, as well as the richest and greatest man in all the land, so rich and great that he was to have married the princess very soon. <clears throat> now he was old and wild and gaunt. A tattered brown cloak hung with rents and holes in it from his thin shoulders, flapping as he ran about, and all his dingy dress was dirty and ragged. He looked like a wandering peddler. What had become of his many servants? There were horses and chariots and the strange beasts from foreign lands that had wandered in the beautiful gardens. The gardens with the pavilions where all the flowers had been in bloom for the princess. Now there was only one tower standing, and at the top of that, it was growing more and more flimsy. Presently, through the walls, their rooms could be seen. In one of them stood a golden cage, and in it was a parrot. Very soon, the bars of the cage were like cobwebs, and the parrot began to tear them apart. And then he spread his wings and, with a joyful scream, flew onto the rocks above the heads of the crowds on the shore. Immediately, everyone called a different question to the parrot, who smoothed his feathers and took no notice until, when the noise and excitement were rather less, an old seagull spoke for them all. Then the newcomer consented to tell what he knew of the events of the day. It was due, he said, to the philosophers having lost the magic stone. Upon this stone, his youthful appearance and everything he owned had depended. Early that morning, a great tumult had arisen. The philosopher went out walking. Soon, an old man had rushed in, crying that he lost the magic stone. He commanded that every slave in the castle instantly leave whatever work he was doing and help find it. At first, no one listened to him, for they could not any of them be persuaded that he was their master. Then the confusion had grown rapidly worse, for each one found that he was fading away, growing every moment more pale and more thin. And as the hours passed, all the servants became white ghosts, and then they floated away. The furniture was melting now in the same manager, manner. The tables were sinking down, and the vessels used for cooking and whatnot were falling softly and noiselessly upon the floors, where there were any floors to hold them. Everything was blowing gently about so that the air seemed filled with bits of clouds. Presently, the remnants would be swept into the sea by the passing breeze. And how have you escaped? asked the seagull. The parrot raised his crest and looked very much offended. Because I am real, he said with dignity. I was the only real thing in that whole castle. The philosopher stole me the same time that he stole that magic stone. Stole it, cried the mermaids and the merbabies and the seagulls. Yes, said the parrot. He stole it in a far off land and he stole me. I was to be a present for the princess, for he thought of marrying the princess even at that time. And the philosopher knew there was not in all the world another parrot like me. He opened his wings and puffed up every feather. He was a magnificent creature. The parrot's snowy coat shaped different colors like opals when he moved, and each feather was edged with gold. The crest upon his head sparkled as if there were diamonds in it, and under his wings he was rose red. But I am free, he cried, 
as the diamonds glittered and flashed, free to go home where the palm trees grow and the sun shines, and it never shines in this chilly land. Look well at me while you can, for you will never see me again. Now all the talk was of the philosopher's magic stone and who should find it. And at court, everyone was discussing how this unexpected turn of events would affect the princess's marriage, for it was to have taken place in a very short time. The king was very angry. He considered that a slight had been cast upon the princess and upon himself by the carelessness of the philosopher. He was not well pleased either to know that the great wealth of the man who was to have been his son-in-law was all due to magic. Neither did he like what he heard about the philosopher's appearance when he was last seen. He announced that the princess's wedding should still take place at the time fixed and that she would be married to the first prince or other suitable candidate who arrived on that day. And even the philosopher might take his chance of being first if he were then in a position to support the princess in the luxury to which she was accustomed. As for the princess herself, what did she think of it all? No one knew, for she did not say. She sat at her palace window and looked out over the distant mountains and dreamed of her wedding day. Do you think the philosopher will find the stone? She asked the eldest lady-in-waiting who was in attendance. Well, we may well hope so, your royal highness, said the eldest lady. He is a great and wise man. I hear too that he has been walking only a short distance from the castle when he lost the stone. It can hardly fail to be found soon. The princess sat still and looked over toward the mountains. Do you think the philosopher will find the stone? She asked presently of the youngest and her favorite lady-in-waiting. Alas, your royal highness, I fear it is not likely, said the favorite lady. All the sea people have been searching day and night, I hear, and nothing has been heard of it yet. The princess smiled. She sat and she smiled when the favorite lady wrapped a cloak about her and took a letter that lay by the princess's hand. Then, without permission or instruction, she set out towards the mountains. The princess rested her elbows on the window ledge and watched her out of sight, and perhaps wondered who would be the earliest to arrive and so fill the place of bridegroom on her wedding day. And all this time, as the lady-in-waiting had said, the sea people had been searching day and night. The mer-babies and the little seagulls were quite neglected and did no lessons, for everyone was too busy to attend to them. They played about and romped on the shore, and when they grew tired of hunting for the philosopher's stone, they rested. The seagulls had told the land birds who were searching the woods and the fields, while the freshwater fish knew of it from their relatives in the sea, and they were searching the lakes and the rivers, and then the seagulls determined to consult the great albatross of the southern seas, the king among all sea fowl. They arrived one sunny morning and found him expecting them, for he had heard what had happened in the first place from the parrot who had passed that way. So he was prepared with his answer, and it did not satisfy the seagulls at all. They went away very much disappointed, for the albatross was in a bad temper and said only, go home and attend to your children. They waited about until late, but he would say nothing more. So they were obliged to return and confess their failure to the mermaids, who sympathized with them and agreed that it was very ill-natured of the albatross to say so. They proposed to go to the sea serpent and ask his advice to which the seagulls thought, that's a good plan. They set off at once for the deep seas where he lived, inquiring of the fish they met whether any news had been heard. But the fish had nothing to tell, and the mermaids came to the sea serpent's home. He was curled on a great rock throne with great giant seaweeds of all colors waving around him and the stars of the anemones gleaming out from the dark corners. The sea serpent listened to the request of the mermaids but they met with no better luck than the seagulls, for he said exactly the same thing. Go home and attend to your children. Then he retired into the great cave and would not come out again. So the mermaids went home, sad, 
they began to think that they might have to give up the hope of finding the magic stone. Of course, the Mer babies heard all that was going on. They discussed the situation as usual. They did not mean to be left behind in this business, though they were not considered to be of any consequence. It was evidently correct to consult somebody who lived far away, and they thought of the wise white bear. He was farther off, too, than either the albatross or the sea serpent, for he lived at the North Pole. But when he was mentioned, the very young merbabies, for once, suggested it was nearly their bedtime, and they found that they were sleepy. Someone whispered that the white bear ate poor seals, and the youngest merbabies crept into the holes in the rocks to rest, they said, while the little seagulls went walking home, one behind the other, right across the sand without having been called home. <clears throat> but the older merbabies, the brave ones, they set off for the North Pole. They arrived at home the next morning, very tired and very cross. And when the sleepy ones who had stayed behind asked what the wise bear had said, they would not tell. And for the first time, the merbabies quarreled. They declared in the end that they would, none of them, look for the philosopher's ugly stone ever anymore. So, if the princess really wanted to marry the philosopher that day, she had lost some of her helpers. But no one knew what she wished, for she never mentioned him. She sat at her window and looked out over the mountains and gazed ever outward. It was the night before her wedding. She had been there all day and for many days. It was very quiet, the lamps were lighted, and the eldest lady-in-waiting spread out the lovely robes ready for tomorrow where the princess might see them, but she never moved, she never spoke. As midnight approached, she leaned out and let the soft wind blow upon her face. The hour of midnight was striking from all the belfries when a great clatter sounded down below in the courtyard. Horses neighed and men ran about and the princess leaned more forward and listened. And then a horseman whose jewels sparkled in the moonlight looked up and kissed a hand to her, and she kissed hers to him. And it was one minute past midnight, and the morning of her wedding day. She dropped the curtains and turned to greet the favorite lady-in-waiting who had come in. The princess threw her arms around her lady's neck to welcome her back. She was so glad and happy. So it came about that the prince of the city over the mountains was the first to arrive on that eventful morning. For through and through, all the rest of the night and up until the very hour of the wedding, noble princes and their retinues were received in state by the king. All of them had to be told they were too late, and most of them rode off again at once. Some, who had never seen the princess, but who had been attracted by reports of her beauty and stateliness, waited to attend her marriage feast and to regret that they had not hurried themselves a little more. As for the philosopher, who should have been one of the chief persons of interest on that important occasion, no one even thought of him, unless the princess did. But she, she looked too well pleased for anyone to suppose that she missed him, which was fortunate, for he was never heard of anymore. And when the eventful day was past, the mermaids and the seagulls covered the shore once again, talking it over. And the merbabies and the little seagulls stood around listening. Presently, the mermother said, No more holidays. Lessons start tomorrow. And the merbabies sighed. And the little seagulls looked gloomy. And one of the merbabies stepped forward holding something. Please take care of our pretty ball for us, she said, until the holidays come again. And as she was speaking, the mermaids all sprang up. And they and all the grown-up seagulls cried with one accord. The philosopher's stone! And sure enough, it was. It lay in the mermaid's hand, all glowing with its magic blue, pale and dark by turns, and its wonderful veins of panting as if it were a living thing, and its threads of gold moving and twining underneath around the red heart burning deep in the middle of it. That! cried every one of the merbabies and every one of the little seagulls. Why? We've had that the whole time. We've found it in the sand and we've played with it every day since. Then the seagulls remembered what the albatross had said. 
And the mermaids remembered what the sea serpent had said. And the merbabies remembered what the white wise bear had said. And they all looked at one another. And now arose the question. For she had done for the princess what no one else had thought of doing, in carrying her letter to her true love so that he might be in time to win her. The happy day just passed was entirely owing to her devotion. The stone was duly presented to her, and accordingly, she became the richest and most beautiful woman in the land, as she was already the kindest. And while the sea folks generally, and the merbabies in particular, gained great fame and distinction, for had they not found the magic stone when it was lost and given it to the nation's favorite? And they do say that the favorite lady-in-waiting married a charming prince who was almost, but not quite, as captivating as the husband of the princess. Well, that's our story for today. The merbaby saved the day. I'm Melissa George, and this is The Mindful Heart. Join us next time for another exciting adventure.